It's true. Under 60 minutes, you're going to learn enough Unreal Engine to make a short film. You're going to go from zero to understanding how to get around in the interface, how to bring in an environment, how to grab some actors and some animation and assemble them together, add some cameras to block out your shots, even animate some light values, then render it all out to create your short film. So let's get started. First, you'll need to go to unrealengine.com, sign up for an account, download the software, and you'll be ready to go. If you open your launcher, you want to go to the Unreal Engine tab. You'll see there's a few tabs across the top here. Generally, you're going to go to the library if you want to manage what version you have. I think if you just downloaded, 5.3 should be the default. If you need to add other versions, you can click here to add other versions. But generally, I just go right up here and launch from this top corner at the beginning. You don't need to come to this versions tab. It's just showing you what's there and your Unreal project browser is going to pop up. This is your previous recent projects, but I'm going to go and start a new one. We're going to go with the games template because some of the default settings make it a little easier on our computers for this learning process. So go with blank and down here in these defaults, make sure you check this box starter content and go ahead and give it a name. Let's just call it short and that'll create your project. If you have these pop-ups, you can just close them, dismiss, or say not now is fine. Now, when your project launches, it's going to look a little bit different than what I have set up. So let me reverse what I've done, and then I'll show you how to build back this so that we have these windows that are a little more common and useful when you're learning. I'm going to close right here where it says Content Browser, and I'm going to close where it says Place Actors. And this is what you should see when you first open your project. Before we add back those tabs, let's just talk about how to navigate around here in your viewport. First thing we want to talk about is what you can do with just the left mouse. So the left mouse, if you click and push up on the mouse or pull back on the mouse, or as you're pushing forward, you kind of veer to the right and veer to the left. So this, just take a second and kind of move around. This lets you drive around the scene, staying at more or less the same height but you're just kind of walking forward, walking backwards, and then you can just kind of navigate around here with the left mouse. Hopefully nobody's nauseous, sorry about that. Then next is middle mouse all by itself. Now middle mouse, if you click and drag, you'll say, well, I get the idea that it's panning, but it's a little bit opposite of what I'm used to from my other software. So that is a quick fix, and you're gonna usually wanna change that right away. So go up to edit, editor preferences, and up in the search here, just type middle. It's easier to find it this way than to go searching through all these menus. Just type middle, check this box, inverse middle mouse pan, and close this window. You don't need to save it, it saves it when you close the window. Now when you middle mouse pan, it's gonna feel much more comfortable like what you were hoping it would do. And then right mouse all by itself pivots on the actual camera position. So as I'm right mouse clicking and moving my mouse, I'm not moving anywhere, I'm just rotating around that single position for my camera's point of view. So that is left, middle, and alt mouse all by themselves. Now for you Maya users, say for example you want to click a chair and hit F. F is the common hotkey for framing anytime in Unreal. If you alt left mouse, you can pivot around or tumble around the object that is in frame that you framed on. So that's a pretty common workflow for anyone with Maya. If you are a Maya user, you're going to find Unreal nice and easy because it's a lot of stuff's very similar. Alt middle mouse does pan as well as expected. It's really no different than middle mouse without alt key held down. And then alt right mouse does what you would expect as far as zooming in and out uh, with your camera view. So that is with the alt mouse for all of those options there. Now there's one other way to navigate around the viewport. If you're a gamer, you're familiar with WASD keys on the keyboard. If you right mouse and hold and do WASD, you can get around your scene that way as well. If you're savvy working that way, then you'll be happy. So that's how you navigate around in the viewport. Let's talk about moving objects. So say I select the chair here, I get the manipulator for moving here. That's just your three axes. Up here is select, move, rotate, and scale. If you hover, you'll see the hotkeys are Q, W, E and R. Again, similar to Maya. If I use the move tool, I can move things in a particular axis, or I can grab it from the center and move it in arbitrary axes, or I can grab it on one of those little planes there that lets you move in just two axes at the same time. With the rotate tool, it's a little unique as far as a manipulator goes. You sometimes got to spin around to see which one is which, but that lets you do your rotations. 
and then scale is scaling. If you grab it from the middle, it's uniform scale. If you pull up and down on a particular axis, it's just that axis, control Z to undo. And then if you were to hover right over that, it's kind of tough to see, but that little triangle spot there, then it's gonna scale in just two axes at a time. One other handy button here before we get away from manipulators is this one here toggles between your world space and local space. For example, the rotate tool. Right now, the rotate tool is not oriented to the chair in particular, it's oriented to the world space. So down here is our world space little gizmo here to show us what way is X, Y, and Z. But if I wanna rotate the chair relative to the chair, if I click this button, it switches the gizmo over to be in the chair's space. So I can tilt it forward directly on the axes of the chair. And then if I toggle that, it goes back to world space. Now you may have noticed that as I've been moving my objects around, they're a little steppy, right? So if I click, it kind of pops from A to B. Up here are your snap settings. So this is for snapping during moving, rotating, and scaling, these little blue buttons. That means they're enabled. The numbers next to them represent how much it's gonna snap. So right now, it's set to snap 10 units. If I switch you know, to 500, now it's only gonna snap on increments of 500. And then if I don't want any snapping at all, I can just turn that off. And then it's nice and smooth. All right, so that's enough of looking around the viewer and moving objects for now. Let's look at some other parts of the interface. Here I have an outliner, which again is similar to other software you may be used to. Anything you have in this what I'm gonna very carefully call a level. I'm not gonna say the word scene, even though I'm tempted to. From Maya's point of view, you would call this a scene. But in Unreal, this set of things that we're looking at in the viewport is referred to as a level or also called a map. We'll get into that a little bit more, but they basically mean the same thing. So I got a table, here's our table. I got a chair, here's our chair, right? And then those are in this folder called static meshes, which are a little bit different than Maya. The folders in Unreal don't have any kind of transform attribute. It's just for organizing things. So it's just basically a folder like it is in Windows or a Mac. You can pick things from the outliner here, or you can pick them in the viewer itself. And then the eyeball icon will hide your object. And underneath the outliner are the details of that particular object. So if I pick the chair, I come down here, here's the transforms. This is telling me what mesh it's using. This is, you go a little bit more down. This is the material it's using. And right here, sometimes this will throw you off. There's, these are little filters. So you'll notice it kind of stops when I get to the bottom here, but there's a ton more attributes in the details here. I just need to switch from general to all, and now it's gonna show me all the details for a particular asset. So this is a quick way to filter out just the little bits that you might need. You know, Say you just need the LOD information on the chair, you can click on the LOD button but then everything else is hidden. So again, if you need everything back, just hit all. Also, it's really handy to use the search. For example, hit LOD, and then you'll see anything that has to do with LOD as well. Back to the idea of this content browser that I hid. If I click on this button that says content drawer, what's in the content drawer is everything that is in your project. You can think of it as a library that you could use in various levels. We started this template with starter content. So here in the starter content folder, I have some blueprints, HDRI, some audio even, and some props. This one's probably the easiest to start with if we go in the props folder. Here's the chair, here's a couch, here's a lamp. These are all the things that you could put into your level. For example, let's put another chair in. The way you get a chair in your level is you just drag and drop. And now I have another chair in my level. Now you'll notice the content drawer went back away. So that is a feature in Unreal 5. If you're coming from 4, that's gonna be a little different. So if you click on the content drawer, it pops it up temporarily, but as soon as you click away, it goes back hidden, which is handy if you want a lot of screen space. But for learning purposes, we want this up quite a bit. So I'm gonna click on the content drawer. If you come way over here, you'll see there is an option to dock in layout. So I highly recommend you click that button. And then now that becomes a permanent panel and it actually renames to content browser. The content drawer is technically still down here as well and it'll be there in all your windows, but for now we want the content browser permanently up so that we can browse through and find things to put into our levels. So say you want a couch, you can throw a couch in the level. If you want to zero out the position of the couch, say you wanted it world 000, you'll come over here to the details for the couch. You can hand type 000, which totally works. Or let's delete this couch and bring in another couch and I'll put it somewhere arbitrary. 
A quick way to do that as well is you'll see there's this little icon. Any value that's not at its default, you can click this little guy and that'll pop it back to the default. So that set that to 000. So this is your content browser. We'll spend most of our time bringing in assets and importing and managing project here in the content browser. Now there are some things that are built into the engine itself that you don't need to bring into the project. So again, all these things here are things that you're bringing into the project. But if you go up here to this little box with a plus and click on that, you'll see there are some other built-in assets. For example, lights. You have all your light types here, cinematics for your camera and camera tools, visual effects, volumes, and a few things that are, again, just built into the engine, like other software has primitive shapes and lights. This is handy, again, that it hides when you're not using it. But for our purposes for learning, let's go ahead and click on this and choose the option Place Actors Panel. That will take most of what's in this dropdown and permanently put it in this little Place Actors tab. And you can now click through this little light icon, shows you the light section. This slate shows you the camera options and such. So I'm going to go back to the light tab here and I'm going to pull in a point light. So similar to getting things out of the content browser, to get things out of this tab, out of the engine, just drag into your scene. That puts a point light in the scene. You'll see it's now part of the outliner because it's part of this level. And your attributes for it show up here in the details tab. If you scroll down, you'll see here's your intensity. All right, so you can boost that up and change your light color, all the things you would kind of think you could do. You can do here, if you want to get rid of something, just select it and delete it. And now it's gone. So that's how you add stuff from the Place Actors panel. Now, one definition to get over early is the word actors. In Unreal, actors applies to things that are not just characters. Generally, coming from VFX or animation, when you hear the word actor, you might think a character of some kind or something at least rigged. Nope, in Unreal, basically anything is an actor. Over here, you'll see your floor is an actor. It's a static mesh actor. If I bring in a camera, this is an actor. You'll see it says Cine Camera Actor. So you can kind of almost, not in every case, but you can generalize the word actor to mean anything. Just something to keep in mind. For a moment, let's talk about that idea of levels and maps. So right now, as we look in this little setup here, this is called the minimal default map or level. Again, just get over the fact that they mean the same thing. If I go up to File, New Level, and for cinematics that we're making, we're not dealing with games, so we're going to stay away from these options for a moment. We're going to go all the way here to Empty Level, and we're going to create it. Because we made changes to the minimal default level, again, which is this out here, it's asking us, do we want to save those changes? Yes, we do, because I took a lot of effort to put that couch in there. So I'm going to say, yes, save those changes. And now we're met with a brand new untitled note up here in the left. This is always going to tell you what level you have open. It's untitled. We haven't saved it yet, but it's a blank new level. The outliner is completely empty. And now it's a empty palette for us to throw anything into. For example, let's go and while we're on the chair mode, let's throw a chair into our empty level. And I'm going to come down here to the attributes in the details panel for the chair. And I'm going to zero that out. Just to set it at 000, I'm going to click F to frame it. And there's our chair. Now, one thing that's a little unique here, and I'm not sure if it's a bug or a feature, but when you drag this in here, technically the only thing in this level right now is a chair. There's not even any light. Up here where it says lit, if you switch that to unlit so you can see the texture preview, but then you switch back to lit, which should show you the interaction with lights, it will be all black. Now this is actually what it should look like from the beginning. I don't know if they give you like a little starter light in the beginning just so you can see where you placed it, but technically it should look like this. There should be nothing in there until you, I'm gonna drag in a point light, until you bring a light in your scene. Now the light will interact with the chair and you'll be able to see it. This over here represents what is in our current level. And again, the level currently is not saved. So let's go to file, save current level and it wants to keep it somewhere in your content folder. So I'm going to make a new folder right here. I'm going to right click, say new folder. I'm going to call it my maps. You can call it whatever you want, but I'll just call it my maps. So I know this is one that I made. I'm going to go into there down here where it says new map. It's just going to be the name. I'm going to call it the chair and light and save that. So notice up here in the upper left, it's saved my new level called chair and light. 
and this is the contents of my level. And if you go down and look in your content browser now, you'll see you have your My Maps folder, and here's the icon for a level, again, or map. Notice if you look down, I can't point to it because my mouse has hovered over it, but if you look down in that list of pop-up attributes, you'll see that says primary asset type is a map. Then at the top of that list, it says chair and light level in parentheses. Again, they are the same thing. That's probably the last time I'll mention it, but just it's worth overemphasizing at the very beginning that the word level and the word map mean the same thing in Unreal. So that's great. We made our own map and maybe we want to go back to our other map. So where was that other map we started with? If you go into the starter content folder, in that folder, there is a maps folder. And here you'll see it looks like six maps, but technically there's only three because each of these data files kind of go with the, the actual map. So look for the one with mountains. Those are your map types. And minimal default, that's the one we started with. So let's double click to reopen that map. You can only have one map open at a time. So double click it and it's going to open up the other map that we started with. If you want to go back to your chair map, you can come over here, go back to your My Maps folder, double click, and switch back to that map. If you ever are unsure where to find a map, say you lost it, like, where did my map go? Just go all the way up to your content level, select this little filter button, and say just show me all the levels or maps anywhere downstream from the content folder, and this will show you here's the three that were together, the starter map, minimal default, and advanced lighting in the starter content folder. And then here's our chair and light. If you need to know exactly where it is, just hover over it and it'll give you a path. But otherwise, you can just double click from here to load any of those maps as well. And then just remember to turn off your filter when you're done using it because sometimes you'll wonder where everything went and it's just because you have a filter still turned on. So while this is a fairly exciting scene, for our short film, I think it's a little limited. So let's talk about how to get some free content from the Epic Marketplace to be able to build your short film. So let's pop over to the launcher and go to the Marketplace tab in your launcher. And let's go straight to the free option here. And we want to select that, then come over to the search tags and choose environments. And here's a bunch of different environments you could use now. For example, here's a nice bistro and here's a nice uh, Northwood abandoned mine, I guess. So come over here to the search field and type the word Assetville because this is a pretty extensive set, but it's also very lightweight. It's very Roblox. You know, it's not very high resolution, but it is kind of a fun, there's a lot of little vignettes and it's just a fun place to start with for practicing. So what you need to do when you go to Assetville here is you need to kind of buy it. You'll see there's an option, uh, add to cart or something like that. When you get there, it's like buying it, but it's free, so it's no big deal. So go ahead and do that. When you're done with your purchase, you can come back here and choose add to project. And then you can find your short and add to project. And that's going to add that content into your project. So if I minimize this, you'll see there is now a folder in your content browser called Assetville Town. So let's explore town a bit. Generally, when you grab some sort of asset pack like that, you want to look for their maps folder because that's how you're going to load the level so that you can interact with it. So let's go into the maps folder for Assetville Town. And there's a demonstration map. That's kind of the layout that they chose as an example city. We'll land on that eventually. Let me just jump into the overview map because there's usually an overview as well. An overview often is just a inventory of all the things that come with that map without any particular layout, right? So here we have a bunch of the floors you can use. Here's a bunch of the cars that you can use. So this is more of a go shopping kind of list and just to be able to see what you could build by hand. But in our case, we wanna just load the demonstration map so we don't have to build anything by hand. You can still modify the demonstration as much as you want. If you want to move this sheriff car, you can move it over there and such. So you can still modify anything that's in a particular map. It just gives you a good starting point. So take a minute to poke around here. You can just, again, hit F to move closer. I like to alt-click myself to pan around. But again, left mouse all by itself. You can kind of walk around town, see what they got around here. So again, take a minute to kind of look around, explore. So we've loaded our location, our environment, and now we're ready to start putting in characters that we want to animate, and then we'll get some cameras in there and make some shots. 
Let's go to a site called Mixamo.com. It's an Adobe-owned site with free characters and free animations. Now you might think, hey, can I use one of those metahumans? Yes, eventually, but let's start easy and understand how this works. Then you can layer on some little more complex workflow. So once you sign in or create a new profile and sign in, it's free. If you don't have one, just create one. Scroll through your list of characters here and find a character that you're interested in using in your short. You can come back for more, but let's just start with one. So I'm going to switch over to this uh, crash test dummy character. And before we deal with the animation, let's just start with the character itself. So you'll have your character here and you want to choose download. So when you download, you want it to be in FBX and you want it to be in T pose and then just hit download. Moving this aside for a moment, back in your content browser, you need to import your assets into your content browser. So I'm going to go to my content folder. I'm going to right click and choose new folder. And I'm just going to call this chars for my multiple characters will live in here. Then going in here, I'm going to right click again, make another folder because again, I'll eventually have more than one character. I'll call it dummy and double click. And the name of your character is going to be whatever the download name was. So if you want, you can go change your name before you do an import. But from my download button here or your finder, or you could even right click, go to import and go browse for your asset. But for me, it's pretty handy since the download icon is right here. I'm just going to drag into this empty dummy folder and you're going to get a pop up dialog for the import options. Basically, for now, leave everything at the defaults. You'll see that it has a field here that says skeleton and our character does have a skeleton. So leaving this to none might make you think we're not importing the skeleton, but that's actually not the case. It's kind of backwards from what you would think. So trust me for now, just leave it set to none. Make sure these check boxes are here. Everything should be fine with the default. Hit reset the default if you're not sure and then hit import. Import all would be if you were bringing in multiple FBX files, but we're just bringing in one. So a single import gets the job done. You could hit import all. There's just one thing you're importing. So it really doesn't matter which one you hit here. And it's going to bring in your character, the skeleton, the textures, all into this single folder. Depending which character you grabbed, you may have some rigging issues here, but it's totally ignorable for what we're doing. So just close that. And here's your character. You'll see it kind of separates it into different asset types. Here are the individual textures. Here's the material it's using for that. And then here's the actual character, the skeleton and the physics asset. Just grab the one with pink. That's your skeletal mesh. If you hover, you'll see it says skeletal mesh and drag your character into the scene. Now you might think, can I use one of these guys instead? Eventually, yes, just like the metahuman idea. You can do whatever you want in the future. But for now, let's just keep it easy and learn how it works. So we have our dummy here. I'm going to go ahead and put him on the sidewalk. All right. So if you hover him up and you hit the end key on the keyboard, E N D on the keyboard, end key, it'll snap him down to the ground. That can be handy. Depends on what collisions are set up for the objects around here. But in this case, it works out just fine, but it's, it doesn't always work, but when it does, it's pretty handy. So here we have our static character in our scene, but he doesn't have any animation which is fine. That's part two. Go back to Mixmo. So I'm going to come back to Mixmo here and now go to the animations tab. And we're going to get some animation for our character. Let's grab a walk. Eventually you can get whatever else you want here, but let's all do the same thing for the moment and understand how it works. You can add your own creativity later, but let's just go get a walk cycle and pick a walk for your character. Let's do this one here. Any walk is fine. Now, one thing that's important to notice here is he is walking away from his starting point. The way we're going to want to animate this guy and have him do multiple cycles and hook him up with his other animations, we want to click this box in place so that he's walking in place. This is going to make extending the cycle much easier. There are some properties here. For example, if you want to, you know, do overdrive and make him go a little bit faster, you can, you can tweak some of these settings here if you want. But for now, I'm just going to leave everything at the default and you want to hit download. 
we do not need the skin because we already downloaded the T-Pose character and that has the skeleton and the skin. So actually we definitely do not want the skin. We just need the animation data. My default project was 30 frames per second. I'll go ahead and leave it as that. And I won't reduce keyframes and we want FBX. So this is the settings you want for your animation and download. So that grabs the walking cycle. I'm gonna go in here and also choose a run. Just do a quick filter and we'll do fast run. He's so fast, but again, he's running away from his starting point. So you wanna click the in place button for this particular situation and download this. So again, without skin, FBX 30 frames per second and none. If you like working in 24, cause that's what you're used to in life, then go ahead and switch it. I'll show you where to switch your project when we get back to uh, animation as well. And then download. And that downloads the run. And then, I don't know, maybe we'll also have him blend into a drunk run eventually. He gets tired and just kind of runs like he's drunk. So we'll go ahead and, and make that in place and download that. Same settings, download. So we have three animation clips that we want to use on our character, which is fine for now. I'm going to move this out of the way for a second. And now we want to import those animations to have available for our character. So in this same folder with the character, I'm going to right click and create another folder and call it anims and go into here and I can bring back my browser and I have my walking. So I'm going to drag in walking. And this is a little bit different of an import. It looks the same, but it's slightly different because it is a different type of asset. So here it says import. This is what we're importing, the walking asset. This is where it's important to pay attention to this skeleton field. So what it wants to know now is what skeleton is this animation for? So go to your drop down, and I have some other characters in the scene because it's a assetville. So there's some assetville characters and there's even some cars because it doesn't it doesn't know that this is a character per se. So you need to tell it this animation is for this character. And then the rest of the defaults for now should be fine. So they hit import. And that brings in that animation clip for this character. Now you might say, wait a minute, I thought we didn't bring in the skin. We didn't, but because we hooked up the animation to the skeleton, it's just giving you a preview here of that's the character that it's being used on. So let's do that again. We're going to grab another of the animations and drag it in here. Same thing, tell it which skeleton it's for and import. Now you could have done all three of these at once using this, the import all option. That's what that's for, but I'm just doing it kind of the long way here. But you could, for example, bring in 20 animations at once. You just drag them all into here or browse and select them all whatever settings you use here, it's gonna use that for all of them and then you would hit import all and it brings in all 20, for example. So here are my three animation sequences that are ready to use on this character. So now, the most important part to understand about making a short film involves this next asset type. It is called the level sequence. Again, the most important part. So follow this part really closely. I'm gonna to go to the content browser. I'm gonna make a new folder and I'm gonna call this folder cinematics you can call it whatever you want but cinematics is a good word for it and go into this folder right click in here and go to animation level sequence a level sequence is a record of a bunch of things that happen in a level don't think of the word sequence like we do in animation or visual effects that it's a bunch of shots so put that definition on hold for a minute ignore that and just accept this new word sequence and i'm going to select that I'm gonna call it, because I'm not gonna call it shot one. Oftentimes they're broken into shots, but they don't even have to be that specific. I'm gonna call it bunch of action 01, right? Because it, it could be a shot, it could be a sequence, it could be anything. This is just a container holding animation information. So double click to open it, and it'll open into this tab called the sequencer. So now the sequencer, this is just the tab name. You can think of it as an editor, for your level sequence. So over here, you'll see what level sequence you have open. So we're working with the bunch of action 01 level sequence. And again, this looks familiar in the sense of if I hit play, here's a timeline and it's playing through a timeline and nothing seems to be happening. That's because 
the purpose of a level sequence is to hold in this area over here to hold information that you want to animate or override or have any record of that's different than this static world sitting here. So if you think of the level as a static world, then the level sequence is used to add any kind of changes to that static world. Think of it as this is a stage and a whole bunch of actors and props and backgrounds have all showed up on a stage, but they're just going to stand there and do nothing until you have them do something here in a particular level sequence. So I want this character to be animated and to accept some of those animations that I made. So I'm going to add a track for this character. If he's already selected, I'm going to select add a track, actor to sequence. Remember, actor can be anything really. And then choose this here, which is my character. If I've pre-selected the character, it'll show up here. If I didn't pre-select it, I'd have to go find him somewhere down here. This is one way to add stuff to this level sequence. I'll show you another way later. So for now, choose this. And that puts your character in here. The movement of this character, just the straight X, Y, Z, location, rotation, scale, you can modify. Let me first, before I set any keys, I'm going to make it so he's going down the sidewalk. So let's move him into position first. So this is still his overall base position. So he's standing here in the sidewalk. All right, so he's just hanging out. He's a little crooked here, so let me give him a little bit straighter. There we go. So he's ready to go walking down the sidewalk. But again, if I hit play, nothing's going to happen because he's just sitting there. So I want to add an animation cycle to him for his walk. So to do that, I'm going to put my playhead at the beginning because the animation's going to get added where the playhead is. I'm going to go to animation here and add an animation sample. And we have walking nine was the name of it. So I'm going to click on that and hit play. And you'll see he starts walking, but then he stops walking. That's because that walking loop is only for this part of the timeline, 0 to 31 frames. So I'm going to drag this all the way to the end of my just default 150 frames. You can change your in and out point by just sliding this here. But then I'm going to now hit play. And he's walking along, walking along until you get to the end of the timeline. You could then, if you want, hit this button here, which is looping and then hit play and he's just going to keep walking and walking and walking through the whole timeline and then it'll loop back around. So let's say at this point though I want him to switch his motion into the run. So what I would do here, now we haven't talked about moving him anywhere yet, he's just getting his animation set and then we'll adjust his transform to have him move in the right place. So I'm going to back the animation back up to here. He stops his walk cycle, I'm going to click on the add some more animation. I'm going to switch to the fast run. So now at that point, he's going to start his fast run, which I'll go ahead and pull out to the end, hit play. Now he's doing a fast run. Again, he's in place. So he's doing his walking and then fast run. Now that looks a little poppy, right? Like if I switch just to look around this area and I hit play, watch his animation. It's, it's not very smooth. But you can blend animations really easily by just taking the second animation here, so it's just a clip I can drag, and push it into the first one so that you have some overlap. So it's like a crossfade in video editing, right? So I'm going to hover there, and you can see those little blue lines kind of crisscrossing. That's one fading out and the other fading in. And now if I come back here and hit play, watch his animation. It's a little hit and miss. You might have to make some fine adjustments to see if it merges well, but let's see how it looks. It's actually not that bad. He's walking. I'm going to scrub through here. He's walking. Then he leans forward and starts running. So it's a fairly smooth, I mean, for one shot, just a random drag and drop and slam them into each other. That's actually pretty smooth. So we're going to say that's fine as far as that transition goes. And then we wanted him to uh, start doing his little uh, tired walk, right? So I'm going to back up the animation here. Add one more bit of animation to his drunk run. And then from here, hit play. Again, it pops because we don't have any blending going on. So I'm going to overlap those. Just shove them, shove the second one into the first one, or in this case, third into second. Hit play. And then he slows down to his run. So he has a smooth transition there, then a smooth transition to slow down into his uh, drunk run forward. So let me just pull that out to the end there so it goes all the way up. 
So you get the idea, it's pretty easy to merge these animations. Now the only thing I have to do, since they were all in place, is now I have to determine, which is gonna take a little finesse, which I'm not gonna to spend too much time on, but you'll get the idea and you can spend as much time as you need on it. I need to have a start position here. So here's my character, now looking at the transform track. All I'm really gonna be transforming is his location in uh, X in this case. So if I want to key just the x-axis, I can click on, for, on the zero frame here, I can click on his x-axis. That sets the key here. Then he's taking a few steps, and before he switches into his transition, or maybe right in the middle of it, he's going to be down here somewhere. Right, so he'll have walked down the sidewalk a bit. I could turn on auto key if I don't want to keep clicking the key button right here for that. But for now, I don't have auto key on, so I have to hit that button. But now I'll go ahead and turn on auto key. It's right here. If you like using auto key, just click that button. So now let's check this area and see if he's sliding or if that's decent. Uh, it's a little, well, notice that at the beginning, he starts walking but not moving, right? So if you watch his feet, they're staying in place and then he moves forward. That's just the default of the animation in Unreal. It defaults to ease in and ease out. So if you click on this icon, this is your curve editor, you'll see this is our smooth curve, smoothing into the transition and then smoothing out. I actually want this to be linear if he's walking consistently. So I'm gonna grab both those keys and hit the linear button, which is right here, or the hotkey is four. And now that snaps those to be straight. You might have to come back in here a couple times as you're doing this to straighten out your curves. But for now, we'll go back to the sequencer and he's got a straight walk. I'd say it's fine. He's slipping a little bit, but that's fine. You get the idea. Let's move down the sidewalk here. When he hits the run, he needs to go farther faster. So right about, where's the next transition right here? So I'm gonna pull out and maybe at that many steps he's gone this far, I'm just guessing. Let's see if that's very smooth at all. Let's see. Uh, it's got, you know, there's, see how there's like a weird something in there? You'd just have to mess with the keys in here to get that right. but. Again, that just takes time, but at least you know now how to do it. Then when he gets to here, if he needs to change his pacing again, he's kind of slowing down a little bit. So I'll go to the end of the run, switch to move tool, and come down here. And let's see if that is, if he's slipping or if that's fine. Let's hit play. So now he might be going a little too fast through there. But again, just takes a little bit of finesse for you to adjust the timing to set the keys in the right position, but at least you know how. Now just add a little bit of your own time to clean up the animation that you want for him. And now this character is done in this particular bunch of action. Now we could call this a shot, but generally a shot would have just one camera. I'm gonna show you how you can add a camera, but you can also add multiple cameras for coverage of the shot from multiple angles. So let's take a look at that now. If you stop your animation, and go back to the beginning. Not that you have to, but just have a fresh start here. Let's say our first camera view, we wanna have kind of looking at him from the front. I'm gonna hide up the character here on the track. And I'm gonna bring a camera into the scene by going up to the camera button here. And you'll see there's a Cine Camera Actor. I'm gonna drag that in and pull it up a little bit and hit F and you'll see it's looking down the other way on the sidewalk. So I'm just gonna hit the Rotate tool and swing it around. So it's looking at our character. And we'll move it a little closer. Maybe it's not too wide, whatever. Now I'm, I'm moving the camera, but in a minute we'll actually look through the camera. I'm just getting it in a rough position for now. If you have a camera, you have to have it in your sequencer so that you can render through it in the way that we're doing it. There's other ways to set it up, but for now just do it this way. So with the camera selected, I'm gonna show you the other way to add things into sequencer. You're gonna drag it from the outliner into the sequencer. So now, here is our, it's showing us that we're piloting the camera. When you drag the camera in, you're looking through the camera, and this is the camera's point of view. I'm gonna switch to what's called cinematic view, so I'm gonna go to where it says perspective, and I'm gonna switch to the cinematic viewport. This is the default that we see. When you switch to some cinematic, that shows you kind of your camera framing, but you'll say, wait, that's not my camera. When you switch to cinematic viewport, it kicks you out of your camera. So to go back looking through your camera, just come down here and click on your camera icon again. And now that is the framing of our 
camera. What's nice about this view is you have your controls right here. It gives all your camera information. If you needed some of these overlays like your grid or your action safe, title safe, and those kind of things, you have that at your disposal here, right? So it can turn on action safe and such. So now when I hit play, that is my camera's view for this particular shot so far. Now I can animate the camera position. I can animate anything about the camera actually, also the field of view and all sorts of other things, but we'll get to that in a sec. Let's just start with this camera. And for here, he walks for a few frames. And let's say from here, I wanna switch to, you know, a, a side view camera. So what I'll do is, now I gotta be careful here, so you gotta pay attention. The Right now we're looking through the camera. This is on, and this up here says pilot is active. Pilot means you're looking through it. If I move my view right now, I just moved my camera. So that is my live camera position, All right? So if I switch and turn around here, I'm looking through the camera, therefore that is the new camera position. If you didn't wanna do that, well, you just did. So what you can do is to switch to another camera and to turn this off is either hit the eject button here or hit the camera icon here and that takes you out of the camera and now you have, oh, there's that catch you gotta look out for. If you're a Maya user and you hit Alt and to tumble around, if you happen to hit Alt and hit the character's transform tool or any of the manipulators, it makes a duplicate. It's useful in some cases, but not when you don't want it to happen. So keep an eye out for that. Just delete it if you happen to, to do that. So I'm gonna hold Alt and not do that again. So let's say my next camera's point of view, I want it to be something like this. So I'm gonna make another camera and I'm gonna drag a new Cine camera actor into the scene and pull it up. Now you might say, where'd, where'd the camera icon go? Uh, hit G. So if you're ever missing a camera or all your lights, just hit G. That's the toggle to flip them on and off. And I'm gonna rotate that one just as a quick first view here. And then I'm gonna start looking through that camera. That camera is um, called Cine camera actor three, you might say, wait, here's one. Why did it jump to three? Uh, don't worry about the naming, just change the name when you need to. So I'm gonna go back to my first camera, actually. I'm gonna hit F2 to rename. I'm gonna call it cam one. I'm gonna go to the next one that I just made, hit F2, call it cam two. And you can call it whatever you want. You can call it cam side, cam front. It's just a name. But I need that camera, since I renamed it, I lost it in my outliner here. So I'm gonna type cam to go find it. Cam two right here, I'm gonna drag it into my sequencer. Again, to be able to use a camera, it's gotta be in your sequencer. I'm looking through it currently. And what I'm gonna do for this one is I'm gonna keep it really close to the character and have it follow the character for a little bit. So let's see what that's gonna look like. This icon means I'm looking through it. This also double confirms I'm piloting it. So if I move and get really close to his head, it's really out of focus. Totally something we can fix on any camera. If you look at your camera settings here, you'll see that you have the option in the cam two settings, you have a manual focus distance. So I'm going to left click and drag through that and drag it really low because I'm so close to the character. You'll see it's now coming into focus. All right, so as I do that, it, snaps into focus and once I get close to focus that I think is good enough I can go ahead and set a key here and if this is where my camera is kicking in remember I'm using my other camera up to this point so before this on this particular camera I don't really care what the focus is but the value will stay the same before that keyframe and then another thing I can do is I can have the camera automatically follow this character so I don't have to hand transform and follow him. So the way I can do that is if I have the camera selected and I go to the details of the camera, you would go to the look at track settings. So look at tracking. So I wanna enable it, but first I wanna set what I'm looking at. So the actor to track, I'm gonna use the eyedropper and I'm just gonna click on the actor or the character. So now this is gonna track that character. When you turn it on, however, 
it's going to go down to the character's feet. It's going to aim at the feet because the feet is where the transform handle is for the character. So what I need to do is adjust the offset. So I'm going to drag through the Z value to get back up to the head. So the camera didn't move down. It just pointed to where the pivot point was of the character, which happens to be at his feet. But now if I drag through the timeline as that character is walking, it's going to continue pointing at the character. All right, so I'm tracking at the character. I'm looking at the character's head and I'm following the head wherever it's going to go. If I wanted to move along with the character, I would need to adjust my transform to go with the character as well, which is totally doable. It just takes, again, a little bit of time, but I'll leave you to do that if you want in your particular shot. But let's now see what happens. Let's go up to the top here. And if I go to look through my camera cuts track, so the camera cuts, this is your camera switcher. So right now when I hit play, and I switch to the camera cuts. This is your master camera selection for this particular level sequence. And if I hit play, right now it's gonna look through camera one, still looking through camera one, still looking through camera one, and you're gonna say, wait, I wanna to switch to camera two though. You can switch to camera two, but you gotta decide where you wanna do that. So maybe let's say here, or I don't know where I was, maybe here, I wanna to switch to camera two in the camera cuts track. So I say, all right, switch cameras, hit plus camera, and go to camera two. Now from in the timeline from this point forward you're using camera two. If you want to have a third camera kick in you need to add a third camera to the scene so I'm going to jump out of looking through my camera cuts here by clicking that icon come up here and maybe I'm going to finish the shot uh, from back here or something. So again just going over the how all this works and I'm going to back up that camera a little bit. We'll say it's the sidewalk cam. All right, so for here, we're looking at his feet. And we'll say we'll look at his feet for the rest of the shot. The camera is still here in the outliner, but it's not in the level sequence. So I'm going to select it, hit F2, call it cam 3. And it needs to be in the level sequence. So I'm going to drag it in here. And I'm not going to deal with animating or adjusting. Well, maybe I'll at least adjust the foot focus for the moment. So I'm going to drag this down so at least it transitions to being in focus. And this is a keyable value. If you want it to follow the character, I'll show you how you can automatically do that or you can just set keys. So if I hit play for the rest of the shot, that's what I see him running and then running slow. Right now we're seeing it for the entire frame range because this icon is selected for camera three. So whatever camera icon you have selected, that's what you're gonna see for the frame range. If I come up and set it to the camera cuts, it's gonna be camera one, switch to camera two, and then say from here, I wanna to switch to camera three. I just click on this plus camera. It doesn't mean add a camera to the scene. It just means switch to a different camera here in the camera cuts. I'll switch to camera three and then now hit play and it plays out the rest of the scene from that camera so camera one camera two camera three and finally let's say we want to have the focus automatically track the character that's pretty handy as well we don't have to keyframe it we can go to camera three go to your settings and you'll see there's a focus settings you open that up the focus method if you have it set to manual you have to keyframe it yourself but if you set it to tracking and then you switch over to your tracking focus settings and click on your eyedropper again and go pick your character. And now it's gonna know the distance to the character. So if I scroll through here, he's gonna be in focus the whole time. So starting here, the foot's in focus. So if you hit play, his feet are gonna stay in focus all the way through the shot. So it's automatically tracking his focus. So let's say you're done with this shot and you want to render it out. The easiest thing to do is just come over here to the slate icon, hit the icon, and it's going to default to an AVI sequence. You'll see there's a couple other output types. You could do EXRs or PNGs, but let's just for simplicity keep it as an AVI. 
Here's your quality settings. If it's using compression and such, because it's an AVI, you can uncheck it if you want higher quality. Then you have your resolution, and importantly, where is this AVI going? So it's gonna save down into your projects, saved video capture folder, and then you just hit capture movie to make that AVI. Uh, I need to save all this. It's saving all my imports. And then it begins rendering the sequence, gives me a little preview window pop-up. And then down here at the bottom as well in the bottom right, it's showing me where that is being captured to. So it's being captured right here. So I'm gonna open that up. Open up the capture folder. And then I'm gonna double click to launch the movie file. So there's my short film of that little sequence. Technically, you do know enough now to do everything you need to create your own short film, but let's add a couple more layers of information here. Let's say you want to create some more shots, but in a different location of our Assetville town. What's probably the best is just to go back to your content browser and create a new level sequence to hold the information for that other location. I'm going to grab a level sequence here. Let's call it Bunch of Action 02. Double click and open that. Now one thing to note, because we're in a totally different level sequence now, your character has gone just back to T-Pose because all of the information that was on that character was in Bunch of Action 01 level sequence. So in this new level sequence, just to really understand what a level sequence does, again, all of the characters, all of the props, everything's just showing up where you want it to start with and you use the level sequence to override any kind of information. So let's go into the donut shop. And maybe in this shot, we're not gonna have much action other than just a camera panning and maybe some interactive lighting. So the level sequence can hold any kind of information. For example, let's put our camera in here. I'm gonna bring in a camera and we'll just make it look down the the counter here. So here's a little preview of it. To bring it into our level sequence, I'm just going to drag and drop it in here. So here's the shot of our camera. I'm not going to animate it. I'm just going to show you something we haven't talked about yet. If you have lights in the scene, so for example, I'm going to put a very bright light right here. You can animate light positions and values as well. So to add that to my level sequence, I'm also going to drag it in here. And now I have access to the light attributes. Now you'll notice I have intensity and light color. If you're curious about moving the light, you don't see it as a default track here, but it's no problem. Just go to where it says point light, add a track, and just add a transform track. So there's many more things you can animate on an object besides what it gives you by default. Anything in the light that has this little icon over here, that means it's a keyable property. You could just click on this and that will add a track as well to your level sequence. So if I add a transform track, I now have the ability to move the light around just like I moved the character in the previous level sequence. But let's look at the intensity. I'm going to set a key here and actually I'm going to drop it down to zero. Drop that light to zero. Come down a few frames and set it to 10. You get the idea. So now in the level sequence when I hit play, I get an animated light source. So you can animate lights. You could also, if you want to do all of your editing here in Unreal, you could do that. I prefer to send it out to Premiere myself and do the editing there, but you could add an audio track. So here you'll see there's an audio track. You need to bring into your project your audio clip as a WAV file, and then you can drop it here. You would just add it as an asset type as well for an audio track. You could even add things such as a fade track. There's a lot of different things you can do with level sequences. You can make subsequences. You can bring them in a shot. So that's that's a little bit more advanced than just the basics of putting your first short film together. But there are different ways to work. And there's really no right way. It's kind of a whatever way works for you situation. So now that I have this little bit of a shot here, right? So I just have a light animated. I'm going to save my level sequence. And if you want, just to further that discussion of how you can work, I have two level sequences here. I'm going to make a third level sequence, animation level sequence, and I'll call this all film. So this is the whole film all together. 
in one giant level sequence. Remember, it's just a container. So in this case, I'm gonna double click and open my all film level sequence. Gonna add a track. This time I'm bringing in the other level sequences, which in this case is referred to as a shot. So I'm gonna add a shot track, add bunch of action one, add another shot, bunch of action two. And now it is like a nonlinear editor of sorts. I'm gonna add some extra frames here and use my out point and drag that way out. So here's my first shot, here's my second shot. Now if I click on the camera icon so that it's grabbing the camera from each one, I can hit play. It's playing through my bunch of action one and then it's gonna switch over to bunch of action two. There's actually not a lot of action in there so it's not a bunch of action, it's a little bit of action. I'm gonna stop that. If I bring this back to the end of shot two as my out point, I can now render this entire level sequence. Again, just hitting this button here. I'll choose an AVI and it's gonna play the two shots together as a single sequence. Once you get a little more into Unreal, you probably won't use this particular interface for rendering. You'll use a different one called the Movie Render Queue. Just to show you how you would add that, you go to Edit Plugins and you wanna look for Render Movie and then, uh, sorry, movie render queue, and you would check that box and you would need to restart your engine. I'm not gonna do it now, this is just a, so you know that's what you'll probably end up doing. You'll switch over to that method. Has extra information here for you. One thing to be aware of, as you've been moving around in your scene, you may notice that, for example, when you go outside, it becomes fairly light balanced, but then as you come closer to something that's relatively dark, it also lightens so there's some auto exposure going on in the scene to try and help balance. But when you're working on trying to light a shot, you actually don't want that to happen. In game mode, it's fine. But to shut that off, what you wanna do is go to your outliner and look for this item called a post-process volume. You wanna select that. This is what's controlling your exposure. And if you go down to the exposure section, in this particular example map, it's already been enabled for a min and max brightness and they're pretty far from each other. So set them both to one and that will essentially lock the exposure. You can also come into your project settings and if you have auto exposure turned on here, uncheck auto exposure and turn that off. So now even though you go into the scene here, it's gonna be a little bit darker. That's actually true to the lighting Otherwise, if you add a light, it's gonna brighten, but then it's gonna darken because it's trying to fix the auto exposure. That's one thing you wanna do if you find you're fighting with your lighting is make sure your auto exposure is turned off. Also, you may wanna add more into your set than just what comes in uh, the marketplace. There is a huge library of additional assets besides the marketplace called Quixel. So if you go up here to this plus again and go to the Quixel bridge, this is a free subscription you get when you're using Unreal. And it's just a giant library of assets. For example, if I go to the 3D assets here, I have all these that I can grab and pull into my project. Let's say I want some food in my project and I want a banana. So I'll just click on banana. Actually, let's switch over to a watermelon. Here's my watermelon. Here's the relative size of the watermelon. You have different texture options for your object. You can choose that here. I'll keep it with medium. You click on download, that downloads it to your computer. Then once that finishes, I can add it to my open project by just clicking the add button. And that's gonna push its way into my project just like the Assetville town did. So it's done already, I'm gonna minimize that. Here in my folder structure, it created Megascans 3D Assets Watermelon. So here's my watermelon right there. Static mesh, I'm gonna throw it on the hood of the truck and now I have a watermelon in my scene. So you can put that now in that level. You'll see it's loaded here in the outliner. So there are a ton of things you can add from Quixel. That's also where you're gonna get. Now this is probably jumping way ahead for you. Maybe go easy, don't, don't go crazy over here. But this is also where you'll find your metahumans. So if you go to metahuman, here's all your different default metahumans. If you were to pick a particular metahuman and start the metahuman creator, this is where you can custom make your own metahuman, but I'm gonna leave that for you for future exploration because it's a little bit heavy for a first hour introduction to making a short, but it is totally possible now. I've got some additional videos that talk about how to transfer animation from Mixmo 
two metahumans, some cool cinematic tools like rails, crane, and shake. Also some videos talking about levels, sub-levels, sequences, subsequences, and my most viewed video, building a control rig from scratch. And that'll push your learning even a little bit more, but we've really covered enough here today to get you up and running so you can output a cinematic sequence, make a little short, and just have a lot of fun with this software. It, it is just fun. It's a easy way to create. If you have questions, throw them down in the comments. I'll try and get to them as soon as I can. And keep exploring the channel, see what else you can do, and grow your knowledge of Unreal Engine. And check it out. We even had nine seconds to spare. And here's a quick plug for my son's YouTube channel. Go watch it.